Welcome everyone. We're letting our attendees come in. We're at about a thousand people right now. We'll be getting started in just a second. Thank you everyone for joining us. We're gonna be starting just momentarily. We're just letting folks come on in. We're at about 1400 participants right now. I just got a text message telling me I should be here. For our attendees, please only use the question and answer if you have a question to ask. Please do not attempt to use it to chat. We have almost 1,600 folks online. We'll give them a couple more, one more minute, and we're going to go ahead and get started. <sighs> um, do we have all of our board members here? Not all of them. Okay. If you could keep an eye out for them, Josh. Okay, it is 535. I would like to go ahead and get started. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Teresa Mitchell Dudley. And for the past five years, I've had the honor of serving as the president of PGCEA. I would like to introduce you to our panelists for today. Um, I have um, our vice president, Yvonne Basich. We have our treasurer, Dr. Donna Christie. We also have with us, um, <clears throat> excuse me, Dr. Suzanne Windsor from our board of directors, um, Christy Anderson, who is the chief legal counsel for MSCA, and Damon Felton, who is also one of our legal minds from MSCA, who handles Prince George's County. We also have two of our unit service with us, Devin Nixon and Brian O'Neill. And the, the and our executive director, Jennifer Epps. Um, did I skip Rainier Miller? I did. Dr. Rainier Miller is also here with us. And I want to thank them for, for being here. Um, there are close to 1,700 people online. So I'm going to go ahead and get started because that's almost 20% of our membership. And I'm pleased to see so many people here today. I just want to start out by going over our agenda um, for today. It's where we are and how we got here. Then we're going to have uh, Jennifer's going to discuss an open letter to the CEO and the board of directors. And we're going to go over some of our requests and demands in that letter. 
we're going to have a review of the checklist for reopening that um, we want you to take ownership of. And then we're going to have um, some discussion about our campaign because um, we cannot sit back and let people do to us. We have to be very um, clear-minded um, throughout all of the uncertainty that we are very certain about what it is that we want to see as educators in any reopening plan um, for our safety. Um, because as your president, I will share with you that there is nothing more important to me than you being safe, our facilities being safe for the children, and that we minimize the exposure um, to COVID. I want to take a moment. I see that um, Philomena Owona has joined us from our board of directors and the MSCA board. Felix Berto um, Lazaro, um, who is also here from our board of directors. And um, I don't see anybody else on there that I haven't spoken to already. These are your PGCEA board of directors members. Um, and you know, I would, I am um, very pleased that there are 1,800 of you on the line here because up oh, here comes Annette Jones, um, who is also on the board of directors, and you can see our board of directors there. You can go ahead. So how we got here, and I'm going to be brief about this. There's this little thing called COVID, and um, we have been through a lot over the past year. Um, with the virus and all of the two issues, two pandemics that we've got going on at the same time. We have the COVID and we also have the social justice piece. But tonight I wanna focus on the COVID and what um, the status is as of today. Uh, um, as you know, um, we were all distance learning back in the spring and then in August, Dr. Golson um, uh, made a decision that PGCPS would be for the first semester distance learning. It gave us great consistency and our families great consistency and it set the gold standard on how um, organizations should be handling this so that you're not causing um, consternation and, and just basically folks freaking out because you don't know from one week to the next week where whether you're going to have to um, be in person, whether you're going to be hybrid. It was everyone was at distance learning. And so as we moved towards November, um, there, was support, there was a release to PGCEA of the reopening plan. And we it was released to us first. We looked at it, we reviewed it, we sent it to healthcare um, specialists at NEA and had it reviewed. And we made our own personal observations based on, not our observations, but what you as members responded to us in the surveys that we have done. And so over the, um, over Thanksgiving break, I spent the Thanksgiving break re reviewing the reopening plan. And PGCEA is your negotiations team, the leadership here. So when the school system comes to us about things, the first thing we do is say, well, what does our membership really think? And that was the reason why Dr. Golson kept us at distance learning for the first semester. Because when we sat down and we met with her back in August, the issue was, well, what does PGCEA want? And I was very clear that 99.9% .9 of our membership wanted to maintain distance learning. And so there wasn't really a whole lot of debating going on at that point. Then in November, after we got the initial, um, re the draft of the reopening plan, and that's what's been posted, that's not, the final reopening plan, that's a draft. And the, the 
um, when the metrics started going out of control um, and the spread in Prince George's County was um, spreading, it was just really bad after Thanksgiving. And Dr. Golson um, said then that she would review the reopening plan after, um, after January, when we came back from the break. Then she made another announcement that said that we would not have any conversations about, um, she was not gonna revisit this until the middle of February. So we've been in distance learning now, the middle of February is next week. We also um, started uh, last weekend, not this weekend, last weekend, with the initial distribution of the vaccine to PGCPS employees. The school system is at the mercy of the Board of Health, the Department of Health in Prince George's County and the state on vaccine distribution. Dr. Golson has been working to try to make sure that everybody gets the vaccine who wants the vaccine. And last week, as you saw, um, we had the first round of 1,400. Now, I knew something was funky back then when they first announced that we, they were going to do that first weekend because the, the week before that, the health department reported to the Maryland delegation that there were only um, 3,500 vaccines left in the county. We got 20,000 employees in the school system. So I sensed then that there, were gonna, there was going to be an issue with vaccine distribution, and I was right. But one of the things that I want to share with you is that um, Dr. Golson does not have control over vaccine distribution. She's working through the state, through the county to try to get our vaccines for us at logical locations for us. And um, I believe you all saw the email that came out at 11 o'clock this morning um, that stated that they were they opened it back up at four o'clock today and there were limited um, spots open for Wednesday evening, Thursday and Friday, and that she hoped that the vaccine would be available um, on Wednesday, the signups would be available again on Wednesday for this coming weekend. So that's what I know about the vaccines, except I will say this. I consulted with my physician before I went and got the vaccine, and she told me that I should get it. You should consult with your primary care physician and make sure that you are, you are able to get the vaccine and that you should. We will talk about accommodations. We will talk about these, those things a little bit later, but I do want to let you know that if you need to document, if your doctor tells you not to get the vaccine so that we, you can apply for accommodations later on. So I did get the first Pfizer, Pfizer last week. Um, it's like a flu shot, you know, just a little achy afterwards and, I, and I'm, I'm fine, but you know, I can't speak for everybody. I know that, I, um, and the reason why I went and got the vaccine is because I'm not gonna ask anybody to do something that I'm not willing to do in a safe manner. And it was safe and it was very well organized for the, anybody who got the distribution. So um, having said that, um, that's how we got here where we are. Now I wanna answer a couple of questions that I have seen already. Number one, right. the return date for PGCPS has not been decided. The reopening plan that is on the that they posted was a draft. The principals were preemptive in sharing with you that we were going back March the first, based on. I'm trying not to cuss here. What the governor said about two weeks ago about us going back March the 1st and threatening us in front of the National Guard and telling us he was gonna do what they're doing in Chicago and North Carolina and Ohio. Well, those of you who know me know that I don't like threats very well. And the one thing I know for sure is that I am here to make sure that you are treated fairly 
and that anything that happens with this return, you are going to be safe. I'm going to say that again. I am committed to making sure that you're safe. So the principals have created a whole lot of anxiety. Um, the governor has created a whole lot of anxiety. And what I want everyone to do is take a deep breath and understand that for the past week and a half week, since we had our rep council meeting, staff and governance have been working on coming up with strategies so that we can make sure that we have a voice in this and to empower you to make sure that your schools are safe. Now, I, I would venture to say that most of you don't know what a safe school looks like, but that's why we're here and Christy is here to help you through a lot of these minefields so that we can get move forward and what actions we need to take. Okay, so that's where we are and that's how we got here. I hear you, I see you in our private Facebook group. I try to respond to everyone as soon as I, can, I see your um, questions and I appreciate those of you that tag me so I can actually see it um, and know that I need to respond to something because a lot of it is, is information and I wanna make sure you have all the information you need. So I wanna move on. And um, I want to introduce Jennifer Epps, our executive director. Um, and Jen, if you have questions, put them in the Q&A. We are, we are looking at the questions in the Q&A. And I do think that a lot of these questions are repetitive questions. So Jennifer. Hey everyone, um, thank you for taking the time out, 2,189 and going up. Uh, to talk about this reopening plan and to talk about some of the concerns that are out there. We recognize, I think last week in particular or the week before that when uh, Governor Hogan came out with his edict, how that, that just raised anxieties of everyone. And so we talked about with the board of, board of directors and our staff and our president, our leadership about what can we do to sort of get our demands out there about what we think safe schools look like. So we took into consideration a couple things. One is NEA, our national organization, they have all kinds of resources and they also have industrial hygienists that are on staff or they are being contracted with in order to around the looking around the country at what the best plans are for reopening and what they look like in a hybrid situation or in a um, full return to school. And so we consulted with them. We also consulted with places around the country who are having the same fights that we are about when to go back, what safe looks like, what vaccines look like, um, and looking at all of the, the um, proposals for memorandums of understanding on what, do you, what are the conditions that would qualify for safety. So we looked at all of that and we said, all right, it's time for us um, as an organization to put it out there and be very clear about what it is that we're asking for. And I know it's not going to be all, it's not an all encompassing of every single thing in the 197 questions that are currently in the, um, in the chat, but it does hit the big bucket items. And what we hope to do is to be able to negotiate with the system so that we can, we can understand what the workload is, talk about safety, talk about all of the rules, all of the concerns that folks have in a document that we all can agree to and every principal and everyone knows what it is and follows it. So I'm going to share my screen to just go over quickly the um, just the letter that we are intending on sharing with the Board of Education and the CEO and all of the politicians. And essentially says we wanted to do two things. We wanted to recognize the good work that the CEO and the Board of Education has done. They led in, in leading the state in terms of deciding for the first semester we're going to be closed. They've been communicating with families and educators in the community, and they haven't to this point been politically swayed by the posturing of the governor or folks that are um, being antagonistic. So then we wanted to talk a little bit about, you know, as educators, what's happening across the country is that parents and educators and politicians are being pit pitted against each other and we cannot have that here. We, do, we did a lot of work through in bargaining for the common good. We did a lot of work with our parents to make sure that we're trying to get on the same page. We can't have uh, 
folks using this as an opportunity to divide us. So we do know that in-person learning is, is good, but only when it's safe. So we talk about that. We talk about how we lost educators uh, due to, to the pandemic early on and how that can't happen again. We also talk about, this is what I, the biggest piece that I wanted to talk to folks about is what do we think is not addressed right now? So one, we need to have investment in safety equipment and facilities upgrades. That includes what we found out in other districts is having adequate air filtration systems in every room where there are gonna be students and educators. We want an investment in testing, tracing and vaccinations. That's already started, but we want the vaccinations that are phased in to be aligned with people who are going back to school. Mina and Teresa will talk about this more, that you know we can't expect for people to go in if they haven't been given the opportunity to um, have the vaccination. Um, we want an investment in improving in distance learning and implementing hybrid models. We know that it's not gonna just go away and that there could be all kinds of variants that come out with COVID or any other uh, uh, issues that are happening that we might have to have uh, distance learning again. We want meaningful involvement with the parents, students and community workers and all the employees. And when I say meaningful, don't just tell us what you're gonna do, but get, get our input, have us at the table um, talking about these things so that we can, you could get a, a full view. Um, we want to incorporate, and we'll talk about this more later, the MSEA checklist on the, as, as how we use as a key metric in deciding what every school needs to have in order to be quote unquote safe. Um, involving the PGCEA unit one selected leaders in the composition of the building level committee. So some of you have seen the draft plan and they have COVID compliance committees. We need to make sure that our FAC and our building reps are represented on those committees. Um, as well as there's a district level reopening task force. We were given the plan sort of as an aside after it was already cooked product. We wanna make sure that we're a part of the conversation that PGCEA appointed folks, that folks that are, we are bylaw and, and Chrissy could tell you, we are the exclusive bargaining representatives. So we have to be at the table. We want make, to make sure that PPE, PPE is provided to all staff and all students. And this is important too, because our partners or our labor partners at 2250, they're fighting for this as well. Um, we wanna make sure that ADA accommodations for, for all eligible staff. So the ADA accommodations, what we plan on doing is also rolling out some trainings on that because some people need to know what eligible looks like. We want hazard pay and adequate staff to prepare for a safe return. And we can talk more in detail um, about what that looks like at another time. We want clear plans, protocols, and communication when there is a COVID-19 outbreak at a school. What happens? Who's supposed to know? When are they supposed to know? Um, we need reasonable self-directed time for educators to transition from distance learning to in-person or hybrid models. You can't just throw folks back in there, right? Like that's not gonna work. We're gonna need self-directed time to, to get all of everything in place that needs to be in place. And then including workload parameters because we all know that the workload has extended and we can't have it extend even more. We need to pull back on what we're asking folks to do. Um, and also a clear delineation between responsibilities of bargaining and positions. We saw some things that didn't quite sit right with us in the draft um, reopening plan in terms of members having to do um, what I would say is custodial workers work. We're not gonna, we're not gonna mix that up. We're gonna be clear about what our educators are supposed to be doing versus our other labor union um, brothers and sisters. And lastly, uh, we wanna have ongoing communication with PGCPS leadership on the uh, safety plans weekly. And so what we wanted to do was lay all of this out. And this was kind of, uh, a montage of everything we're seeing from other districts in Maryland, around the country, talking to our uh, industrial hygienists, talking to folks about what is the best practices and what should we should be asking for. And I'm sure, like I said, there's there's probably more and um, we'll look forward to your emails at, at contacts at pgcea.org so that we make sure that we're incorporating all of this when we eventually get to the bargaining table. So that is my spiel on that and um, yeah, ultimately we need to have a voice when it comes to this and we're not gonna rush back in and um, we need to have something codified that just like your contract, everybody knows what it is. Thank you, Jennifer. And um, for those of you who don't know what Jennifer's role is in all of this as our executive director, 
She is also our chief negotiator. So when it comes to negotiating our contract, um, <clears throat> she is the chief negotiator. And she works very closely with the president, that's me, and the board of directors um, to make sure that um, our contract is, our contract negotiated agreement is the same thing, really. Um, and as we move forward, these are the things that we're going to put forward. Everybody on this call today is going to get a copy of this letter because this letter is not going to sit on my desk. This letter is going to go out to the CEO, the members of the board of, under my signature, the, um, the board of education, the county council, the members of the general assembly, the Senate and the house, the governor and the county executive, because we don't want anybody to have any misgivings about what our level of expectations are as a professional organization. So um, you will all receive a copy of that letter. She went through it quickly. Um, and I know some of the things that you had questions about may have been answered. Um, Josh, are you still on with me? Yes, I'm here. So all of these questions that you're putting in the chat, in the Q&A, if we don't get to your specific question, we are going to find out the answers to these questions. But if your question does not get answered, you can send your questions and feedback to contacts at PGCEA. But we got something even better for you, right? Um, one of the things that one of the things that we have to really look at is what does a safe school really look like? What does it look like for our schools to be safe when we come back? And one of the um, things that MSCA has done in concert with um, the local presidents and um, NEA is put together a safety checklist. What should you look for when you're in your building? Because for me to go around to 200 schools in Prince George's County and try to figure out what's going on, that's going to be tough. So here's what we're going to do. We put our little thinking caps on for this one. And what we're going to do is each one of you is going to get a checklist. Everybody's going to get a checklist. And we have a job form that we're going to ask people to put their responses in the job form once we start really those committees start looking at everything and seeing which one of the um, places where you feel as though your school is not cutting the mustard in, in their school reopening plan. And then that gives me direct, it gives us direct information as to what's going on in each one of the schools so that we can say, oh, this is what we're re getting reported back from this school, it's not ready. Or this school's doing this right, why can't we do this at other schools? Um, so um, the checklist, um, I wanna now turn to um, Christy Anderson, who is um, um, here to speak with us from MSCA about the checklist and some ways that we can use that. And I wanna thank Christy for being here with us. And Damon. Not a problem. Thank you, Teresa. Um, MSCA does have, and it, we've got it in all different forms, uh, what we have put together and called um, a health and safety checklist for buildings and work sites. And I think it is, it is a long list of things that we expect individuals uh, or um, teams to go through their building to ascertain whether or not it is, in fact, a healthy and safe work environment. But I think one of the first things, I mean, most of the counties that are going back, there's a couple, at least two weeks or a week where it is just staff that are in that building. And I think that's an opportunity for the staff to designate a team. The team should, it should include your ESP colleagues. Um, it should, in custodial staff, maintenance staff, because you have to keep in mind that the custodians and the maintenance personnel, they've been in the buildings all along. Um, but it should include not only custodial maintenance, it should be paraprofessionals, it should be educators, it should be an administrator because collectively you should as a team, whether you, this is your COVID compliance committee, but if, if you don't have a broad representation on the COVID compliance committee, I would suggest you 
put together your own committee and you walk through the building with this checklist because it starts not only with the building as a whole, because it talks about whether or not you have appropriate PPE in the building. Are there adequate masks? Um, because there's gotta be a supply of masks. While masks are not designated or considered by uh, the CDC as personal protective equipment, because everybody has them, um, there's gotta be a supply on hand for students that forget or lose or it, they disappear on the way to school, whatever the case might be, there's gotta be a supply on hand. Um, but like soap, sanitizer, paper towels. I mean, it's simple stuff, um, making sure that all of that is available and it's in the building. Um, and there's, you know, that there's a, there's a schedule for cleaning and sanitizing all aspects of the building, whether it's classrooms, hallways, bathrooms. Um, what is that schedule? What is the routine? What is the expectation? Um, and what, how are you handling frequently touched surfaces? How often are they going to be cleaned throughout the day, especially when students are in the building? Um, so there's got to be an increase in the cleaning routines, and you should know what those are before those students come back into the classroom. Um, communal spaces, large areas where people like to gather or um, sit together, those should be closed. Um, they shouldn't be available. Uh, and you're talking about some places in the hallway, it could be the library, unless you're using it for a class, um, but you want it in faculty lounges, they should be shut down um, and not utilized because we don't want folks gathering in one area um, just to hang out, so to speak, uh, because you wanna be able to promote the social distancing um, and keep things moving and keep things safe. Um, there should be signs in the building to indicate traffic flow. So you should be controlling the traffic um, and what direction they should be going down certain hallways. Um, there should be signs on the front door saying that masks must be utilized, that social distancing is in place in this building. Um, all of those should be spelled out and clearly posted at the front door. Um, and then in, there's gonna be certain classes where those physical barriers, the, the plexiglass barriers may be in use, um, depending on the type of class that you have or the instruction that is expected to take place. I can't say that they will be in place in every classroom. Not every desk is gonna have plexiglass surrounding it, um, but there might be certain music, uh, for example. Um, it may be that the teacher is gonna stand behind plexiglass because there's no way you're gonna be safe in that environment, or you might even be teaching in a different room and it will be in through cameras or whatever the case might be. Um, but there's gonna be certain classes, there's gonna be some major adjustments into how some of that instruction takes place. But there, there are gonna be some classes where you will have the plexiglass and the physical barriers um, for students. It might be in special ed classrooms. Um, but these are, these are all things, and the HVAC obviously is a, a, in terms of the building um, consideration. And that's why you need the custodial and the maintenance employees um, to talk about what they've done to the HVAC, what, what condition is it in? What was the last update? When was it last cleaned? I mean, you can only get those questions answered by including those folks on your team. Um, and then the, the checklist goes down into your classroom. Your classroom should be set up so that there is social distancing is in place. Desks are six feet apart. Um, and so you're not gonna have the same number of students in that classroom that you would normally expect. Um, and I will say, for example, in Anne Arundel County, who they've already projected um, that teachers are returning to the buildings next week and students are returning March 1st, 39% uh, of the elementary school population is returning to in-person instruction. For middle school and high school, it's 34 and 36%. I can't remember if it's 36% middle or 36% high school, but one of them is 34 and 36. That's the that's a number of the percentage of students are actually returning to hybrid instruction. No building in the Anne Arundel County will be more than 50%. Hey, Christy, can you pause for just one second? I'd just like to announce to all of our attendees. We see your questions rolling in. If you all could just wait into our, all of our presenters go, because I'm sure that your questions are being asked, answered as they speak. So just give them an opportunity to complete their presentations and then determine if your question has not been asked. Right now, we're at just about 500 questions of which half have already been answered. So just give them an opportunity uh, to finish and then ask your question if it hasn't been answered yet. Right. Thank um, you. 
But this checklist, as I was saying, it even goes down into the classroom. And so it is a question of looking at your classroom. Is it set up to be um, social distancing, to be in place? Um, do you have PPE? What is going to be the cleaning protocols? Are students staying in your room the full day or are they gonna be rotating out? And then who's responsible for the cleaning? Some of this is a, a building specific conversation. We can't answer what the protocol is um, in terms of cleaning. What's the cleaning schedule? It's gonna depend on whether students are rotating or not. And if the students aren't rotating, then the question becomes, well, who's gonna be the lunch monitor in that classroom? Um, so there's, but those are conversations that are going to have to take place in the building. Um, and it should be with this safety team, whether it's a, a, the compliance committee or your own COVID safety team, but there should be conversations in the building. And then that same conversation, because masks are still required. Masks are absolutely, they're still part of the state of emergency. Um, it's mask, uh, physical distancing, social distancing. Those and contact tracing, all of those are supposed to be in place pursuant to the state of emergency. Um, so masks should be worn unless it's contraindicated medically for a student and there's an exception granted. That's the only time that there should be an exception is if it's medically based and they should have to go through a process. The parents will have to go through a process and get that approved, that exception approved. And then there's going to have to be some type of an accommodation. Um, whether it be for the staff member that has to be in the vicinity with a child who might not be masked, or it might be the child gets to remove their mask for five or 10 minutes every hour. Um, and then what do you do with that child when they're unmasked? And where do you place them? Is that a child that you put behind plexiglass for those five or 10 minutes? But those are building specific, classroom specific conversations that that's why this, the creation of this team in your building, whether it's your COVID compliance committee or if it's a safety committee, um, because it's not broadly based or represented, the staff members are not broadly represented on that, the co compliance committee, if that's set up by the county, um, form your own. And because those conversations have to take place in the building and they're going to have to be determined in the building. And then the question of how do you enforce the mask requirements? There's gonna have to be an understanding between the educators and the staff in that building and the administration of how are they gonna enforce the mask requirements? What's going to be the protocol? What do you do with a student who just takes it off because they feel like they could take it off whenever they want? Um, how are they going to be handled? And there might be some general guidelines that'll come out from central office, but these are all very fact specific circumstances. Um, and you, you've got to be able to adjust and apply them on the building level and with the specific student at issue. Um, so there's going to be some protocols that will be put in place. Um, but I think in terms of a deeper understanding of how that's going to work, that's going to have to be worked out in that week or two before those students come back in. Those are all questions that need to be addressed with the administration and worked through. Um, but there's no question, masks are required. They aren't considered PPE, so the school system technically does not need to supply them to you as PPE. Um, but they have to have them on hand. So for if anybody forgets or loses or whatever, um, doesn't, can't find their mask because they set it down somewhere, um, there has to be an adequate supply on hand for whomever um, and so that they can maintain their face coverings. During uh, Christy, the, as far as the PPEs are concerned, I have been assured by Dr. Golson that there are enough PPEs for everybody in the school system. Perfect. Okay. Perfect. And that's definitely what you need. Um, and so, but also those are gonna be for replacement and things of that nature too. So that has to be ongoing. Um, but these are all things that you've got to look at your building. You've got to work out the directions and the, um, so that if the students are going to change classroom to classroom, there's gotta be directional signs and clear protocols put in place that the staff can adhere to and reinforce with the students. And so that all has to be worked out prior to the students coming in um, so that the staff can reinforce it. They, they're models by, by virtue of the fact that they are the um, leaders in that building. I mean, they, they need to be models for their students. And so that definitely needs to be worked out on the building level. There's been lots of questions I can see in there in the, uh, that have been asked in the Q&A around accommodations um, and telework and spe specifically. 
I mean, that there's going to be a process. The school system has to have a process because they still have to provide accommodations. Um, the ADA requires accommodations if it's a um, physical or mental illness that impacts a major life activity um, or ser seriously impairs a major life activity. Um, but the CDC, so those individuals definitely, if you don't already have accommodations in place, um, those should be able to remain um, if you have a regular ADA accommodation. But on top of this is this layer of health conditions that the CDC has identified as putting you at serious risk of illness if you are exposed to COVID. Um, for those individuals, you need to continue to apply. If you haven't been approved or you haven't put in for a request to continue telework, um, that needs to be done. You have to go through the process. The school system does have the right to determine um, whether or not they can meet or if that is a reasonable accommodation, they could also offer you alternatives. Um, I've seen some school systems say, well, we can't grant you telework, but um, we want you to come to the building and we're gonna put you in this classroom and you will still be teaching virtual, but you're gonna be in the building. Um, that's been uh, something that they've done in some counties. So it just depends. It depends on the situation and it depends on the number of students that are going to remain virtual because they are going to need educators to teach all these students that are like the 60% in Anne Arundel County that are going to remain virtual, they're going to need educators to continue to teach those students. So hopefully they're going to come up with a, a, a valid process by which to handle those. One of the things that is key is that if you put in for an accommodation, you should be contacted. There should be a conversation with someone, whether it be your building principal or someone in central office, because there has to be a discussion about what is a reasonable accommodation and whether your requested accommodation is in fact reasonable. But there should be a discussion. It shouldn't be a blanket denial. If you just get a letter in response to your request for an accommodation, you need to contact the association because that has to be addressed. Because blanket denials uh, or blanket responses, generic responses are not sufficient under the law. They actually have to engage you in a conversation the other thing that I've seen in there um, about the use of the protocols around if you have symptoms or if you have a confirmed um, COVID case, uh, what are the protocols? And again, that is something that the school system needs to lay out in very, very clear terms. And that should be done in connection with um, PGCEA. Uh, in, they should be bargaining around this whole idea. One of the things that I think many people know, or we've We've advised folks um, that the FFCRA, sorry, um, the FFCRA, which is the Families First Coronavirus Response Act, which provided for emergency paid sick leave in the amount of 10 days, if you, under certain circumstances, so if you had to quarantine or you had, to, you had a child that you had to quarantine, um, any of those circumstances that you would be advanced 10 paid days of sick leave in order to satisfy that quarantine period. That expired at the end of last year. It doesn't exist. Uh, we have encouraged, and many of our locals have been successful in negotiating a continuation of those 10 days of emergency paid sick leave under the same circumstances that the FFCRA provided for. So it would cover quarantine periods. It would cover um, if you had symptoms and you were being a responsible employee and decided because of COVID-like symptoms, I'm staying home, which the employer should encourage you to do that. Um, you would have this bank of 10 days that you could access and utilize before actually having to get into your accrued sick leave. Um, but that's another thing that I'm sure PGCEA is going to be talking to the school system about extending those, especially as you talk about going in person and increasing exposures. Um, and because at the same time, you want your employees to be very responsible and decrease the possibility of unnecessarily exposing others to that. Um, Absolutely, and that was in the letter. It, that's in the letter that Jennifer um, shared earlier. Um, and that is why, and excuse me for interrupting you, Chrissy. No, that is why I have shared with everyone, before you get the vaccine, go find out from your medical provider whether or not you can get it. 
If you have an underlying medical condition, you have to document it. You can't just say, oh, I'm, I'm, I, I, my leg hurts, so I can't go back because of COVID. That doesn't work. You have, to, you have to have proof from your medical care provider that you have whatever um, reason is for them to provide an accommodation for you. And Christy, I saw one in here um, several times, and I've been asked this several times, if I'm pregnant, and I have, and I, and I can't, I don't want to get the vaccine. Um, what are my options? Pregnancy is not considered a disability um, under the law, under the Americans with Disabilities Act. Um, but the question of whether or not a pregnant woman gets a vaccine is really up to you and the prime, your doctor. Uh, it, there has to be a discussion as to whether or not you're in a situation where you are eligible, medically eligible to take that vaccine or not. Um, the vaccine, we have to keep in mind, the vaccine is not mandated. Um, PGCPS has not mandated that the vaccine be taken. The state has not mandated that the vaccine be taken. This is purely voluntary. Um, but in any situation, um, if it were to be mandated, there has to be accommodations for those with medical conditions. So in the case of a pregnant woman who, again, we're talking about voluntary vaccines, if there is, if their doctor says, medically, I don't want you to take that vaccine, given your, however far you are along in your pregnancy or whatever the conditions might be, if the doctor writes that, I would submit that as a, because you have an underlying medical condition, because again, the CDC, it's unclear what risk there is if a pregnant woman is exposed to COVID um, or potentially exposed to COVID and what the impact of that might be. So it is, it is still one of those, it's kind of an open question under the CDC. And so I would submit, I would suggest that anyone who is pregnant should talk to their doctor. If they're not eligible to take the vaccine, they should get a letter to that effect and they should seek accommodations from the school system as under the CDC guidelines because there still is a question mark um, and seek some accommodations around that condition. I mean, traditionally, I have to say to you from the purely legal perspective, pregnancy is not a disability. Um, but under these circumstances, there are questions as to the impact of exposure to COVID on you as well as your baby. Um, so I would just say you, you have to go through the process, I hope. And again, I think this is gonna be a conversation that PGCEA is gonna to have to really hammer on with the school system that they have a very clear articulated process to handle requests for accommodations for individuals that have underlying health conditions um, because these any kind of blanket response is not going to be acceptable. There needs to be a conversation around that and how best to accommodate those individuals. So I want to hit some of the, uh, the, the bigger questions that I'm seeing in the chat, mm -hmm. some of them. And, and then I want to go ahead because it's one thing to admire the problem. It's another thing to take action and have solutions to the problem, right? Um, and clearly the reopening plan is a problem. And it's a problem for, like I said, because the governor threatened everybody. That's one thing, create a whole lot of anxiety. And then the second thing is the reopening plan draft that the principals have. Now I will share with you, the only thing that the principals have is the draft. Nothing is etched in stone. We don't know when, we're, when the school system is gonna propose to go back. Dr. Golson has not made that clear. She hasn't made a determination whether we're going back hybrid or whether we're going back distance learning, how we're going to handle these things. There, I saw a lot of questions in the chat about the air quality and the, um, the air filtration systems and how that's going to work out. That's where you take your checklist and ask your principal, have they addressed these issues? You find out in your buildings. We're going to request, and we, we have seen um, some of the documents where they set, address some heating and air conditioning um, situations in some of our schools, but not for all 240 locations. So there's a lot to be done here. And it's really important that you, when you get this checklist, 
that you take the time to look at it because one of the things I don't want us to do is complain about things not being right and then not having the data to back it up because then we look really foolish. Um, so um, the other issue was concerning, um, <clears throat> we did talk about the uh, 10 days. Up to this point, I think if somebody has COVID, they're being given 10 days um, for, for COVID. And then if you're beyond the 10 days, I think there are other things that go along with that. But the, as Christy said, the vaccine is not mandatory. Let me say that again. The vaccine is not mandatory. However, it is my position that if you're not inoculated, it is unconscionable for someone to ask you to return to a building when we have had members die and we have had um, schools closed every day, just about when there's only been 3% of the people in the building because of the, um, the spreading of the, of the virus. So I, want to, I really want to make sure you understand where I'm at on that because I believe it is unconscionable for them to expect people to go back when they have not had an opportunity to get the vaccine. Now, I want you to try, right? Doesn't mean, Dr. Golson said it's gonna take six to eight weeks for us to get everybody inoculated who wants the vaccine. Now, anybody who can count, right? When she made that announcement two weeks ago, that puts us at the end of March. And now, because so many, uh, people weren't able to get their vaccine this weekend, I can still count. That's putting us another week, right? So this March 1st uh, deadline is pretty arbitrary and capricious in my opinion. And so here's what we got to do. Number one, we got to get these checklists. We got to get these letters out, right? We want you to take the time to call your school board member and say, we we got to make sure we're safe and we got a plan. We got a plan. Um, Christy Lynch, are you ready? Christy Lynch is our GR committee chair. Yes, she's going to share our our government relations team's um, efforts for um, we're going to do a campaign. Christy, you want to tell them about it? Yes, this um, just piggybacking on what you just said and uh, the letter that Jennifer Epps shared with you. As part of the uh, government relations team, what we're looking at doing is getting a writing campaign together, a show me some love campaign. Hashtag show, show us some love. Part of getting what we need for us means that we have to speak up. And so what we're asking you to do is to reach out to your elected officials. There will be a letter that you receive that is um, that you can use to send out to them to let them know that we only want to return when it's safe. So it's the show me some love, show us some love campaign. And we I'm have graphics, right? Yes, yeah, show us some love. I'm gonna ask that you make sure that you share it with your colleagues because numbers makes a difference. There's a large number of people on here today and we need those kinds of numbers to show up. You need to have your elected officials on speed dial. They represent you. They represent you. So if you don't know who your elected official is, we'll make sure that you find out who your elected officials are because they're accountable to you. So the show, me, show us some love campaign, hashtag only when it's safe, is what we're gonna use to flood the, um, airways, the internet, the emails, whatever it is we need to do. Because if we show up in numbers, we will be seen, we will be heard. And that's extremely important because too often people are silent. We have um, Facebook complaints, Twitter complaints, Instagram complaints, but we need to get our voices out there where they can be heard in their, in their faces to let them know that we need love too as educators. So hashtag show us some love, hashtag only when it's safe. Please share, make sure your colleagues know this is not a time for us to be underrepresented. It's not a time for us to be underrepresented. Uh, Josh, do you have the graphics for the um, 
Valentine's Day campaign that we can share? Ready? Yeah, one second. I'll pull it up. Okay, so we're going to be doing a um, a Valentine's Day campaign. Um, you will all receive this graphic, put it on your social media, send it to your elected officials. Um, and basically what we've learned is that we have to, you know, of course we all want to be safe personally. I'm not besmirching anybody that wants to be safe, right? Because I want to be safe. And when... Um, when we were having our contract negotiations, we talked a lot about the students and what we learned from the um, bargaining for the common good was when we start talking about things that are important to parents and to children, people listen. So our um, campaign is going to be geared towards that. And here's the graphic, have a heart for education. Don't open school buildings, it should be an S on there, until it's safe. Will, our val will you be our Valentine and make sure educators, students, and families are safe? So this is basically what it's gonna look like. Um, and we wanna make sure that everybody, we're gonna send this out to everybody as a JPEG, put it on your social media, put it on your Twitter, put it on your Instagram. It's put it everywhere on, on social media that you can possibly put it. Um, and let me just say this. I have heard, right? I have heard that there are other private Facebook groups out there. Um, and some of them I've tried to even join and they've denied me to be a member of it. I'm not mad about it, but I tell you what, if you want the real information, you will join the PG, the official PGCEA member group because that information is coming directly from your president. Um, Andrette Duncan and I manage that Facebook page along with uh, Melissa Robinson and uh, Lauren on our staff. And all you need to do is click on it and uh, try to and, 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 and submit your information and, and we can get, you don't have to have your Facebook under your real name, but we do have to have your member ID number or your um, EIN number. Cause we have it anyway. We just, that's the only way we can verify it because everybody has um, unusual Facebook names like Boo Boo Kitty, you know? So we wanna make sure that we're able to do that. So, um, so here's the ask. And this is, and then I'm going to turn, I'm going to go back to the questions. Um, number one, we know how we got here, right? We understand where we are, understand that those reopening plans are a draft and the principals know no more than that draft, which is avail available on the PGCPS website. And if I, I have the link to it, we'll make sure that gets out to everybody who was on this call. So you have that. We will make sure that everybody has a copy of the open letter to the CEO and the board of directors with our requests and our demands. The, um, the checklist, you will all get the checklist. We're gonna send it out in one email and it's gonna go to your personal email, not your PGCPS email. If you are on this call and you do not get it, that means we have a bad email address from you or it's in your spam folder. So make sure you look in your spam folder for um, cause sometimes even my PGCEA, um, cause I make sure they send the, um, the newsette to me ends up in my spam folder. So you wanna make sure you look for it there. The board of education meeting is this Thursday night where um, uh, unfortunately they opened up the window and within two minutes it was closed for anybody to put provide testimony and I couldn't get on for this weekend, this, this Thursday night, but that's okay because they're gonna get the letter and they're gonna hear from me over the next couple of days about what we are demanding as an association. Um, I've spoken to several of the board members already and it's okay for you to contact elected officials because if you don't show up and you don't speak up, right? You're gonna end up stepping into situations that you don't wanna be in in your buildings. And I, I, I cannot express that any more clearly to people. Now, we have 703 questions 
in the chat, in the Q&A. And I'm gonna skim through them real quick um, because most of them I believe were answered already. Um, One of the questions that hasn't been answered that I've seen several times is about specialists who travel from building to building or those who don't have designated classrooms. What's the question? Asking what accommodations would be made for them since they don't have classrooms to necessarily be in a space. Um, or are they going to have special requirements as they go from building to building? We don't know that answer to that question yet. We are waiting to find out how the school system is going to accommodate the critical mass first. And I don't mean that they're not important, but the, the way that the school system normally does it is they do critical mass first and then they work on the, the specialists. I will say this, that I was very proud to see Jan Kramer, who is a speech pathologist that travels for several schools, testify at the Board of um, Education budget meeting the other night about how important it is for speech pathologists to have um, safety gear in the reopening. Um, if they're going to bring, if, if we're going to, if we're going to go back from distance learning, just because when kids have speech issues, they spit. So those are the things that you need to make sure that you have that checklist because wherever, if I'm going from school to school to school or going from a couple of different schools, I want to make sure that that school is going to be sanitized because even if you go from school to school, you still should have a place in that building that you have as a, a residence place. There should be some place where you can put your belongings and secure them. So if that's not happening, that's a whole nother conversation that we, we need to have, but that's in our existing contract. Okay, so we are, that, that is a question for us to um, get a better answer on. I, right now, we, we don't know that answer. Next. We also see a question, uh, several questions about vaccines. And so I'll combine these. One mm -hmm. is uh, when can they expect to have more vaccines? A lot of folks have tried to uh, apply or schedule their shots and it's being canceled or rescheduled. Mm -hmm. And the other question about vaccines is saying that it's not good enough for just one person in the household to get the vaccine if they have a family uh, mm -hmm. and what to do about that. And how is the school system going to look to handle that? And what can the union do? Well, what we can do is what we have been doing, and that is to continue to advocate for those who want to get the vaccine to get it. And to, I, I, am, I do have a lot of concerns about this rollout and the fact that um, it has been, hasn't been consistent. Um, and the, the biggest issue, and I'm gonna tell you this, is that Dr. Golson does not have control over the vaccines. That is the county health department, and she is working with the county health department to try to get us the vaccines so that um, we can make sure that our educators who want to get the vaccine can. Now, I will tell you, if you can get the vaccine through your um, through one of the other places, it's okay. There's no law that says you have to get it through Prince George's County Public Schools. I will say that it was a seamless process at the sports and learning complex. You know, it might have been because I was with the CEO. They took pretty good care of us. Um, the other question about the vaccine was, I saw in there is, if we don't get the vaccine, will we still have to go back to school? And I'm going to say it again. It is unconscionable for them to require people to go back and not be vaccinated. Now, if you get the vaccine and your family doesn't, if somebody in your family catches, gets co co the COVID, then you can still be a carrier. So there are a lot of mitigating factors here that we need to address. And as we move forward, um, I do believe that these are the things that Dr. Golson is gonna take into consideration because how do we prevent um, high schoolers who are able to get the vaccine, who don't want to get the vaccine. And I don't know about you, anybody who's taught middle school or high school, it's hard to keep them six feet apart from each other. What other questions you got, Josh? Are you still there, Josh? Sorry, I'm just going through them, scrolling through, trying to answer some of them. A lot of them are duplicates. Teresa, do you want to talk about the blueprint before they're... Oh, yes. So... um. One of the um, things you may have heard, as a matter of fact, I just got a text message from somebody in the media that wants to talk about 
the override of the governor's veto on the blueprint, the Maryland blueprint. Um, the General Assembly is supposed to vote to override this. Um, I believe it's tomorrow or Wednesday and the, the, excuse me, the delegates, and then it will cross over to the senators and the senators are supposed to override it. Please go to marylandblueprint.org, marylandblueprint.org and find out who your senators are and send them a letter saying thank you for overriding the blueprint because the, the delegates and the senators in Prince George's County are, are, are on board with this. We just need to thank them and encourage them to be strong. The other piece to it is that there, because it got vetoed, there was a time lapse on the blueprint. So there's a companion bill that's also gonna need to be passed. That companion bill will make sure that all the dates and all the times line up so that the, 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 the money can flow the way that it is supposed to flow. Um, I also understand that with the next two weeks, they're supposed to vote on overriding the veto of the HBCU bill, um, funding bill, which is really critical for our HBCUs, Bowie and all of them, so that we can have more educators of color in our classrooms um, through Bowie State. Um, so it's marylandblueprint.org. That will be, we're gonna send you one email with all of this in it. Now I know this is a lot of information and I know there's a lot of anxiety. And I'm gonna tell you that my anxiety is yours times 10,000. Every morning I wake up with a knot in my stomach thinking about, oh my goodness, how is this gonna impact our members? But I want you to know that your safety is our number one priority. And we're gonna make sure just like we worked on uh, making sure that the evaluation system was a pilot program instead of a, uh, uh, an evaluation system that hadn't been tested, we're gonna make sure that if it's not safe that we don't go back. And we're gonna make sure that you have all the materials that you need to be safe. For, yes. So we have uh, questions around um, one, if exposed to or contracted coronavirus, uh, will educators uh, have to use their own sick days or will there be additional sick days provided and then about hazard pay? Well, we are, we're looking at hazard pay because some educators are just gonna be exposed to it's, it's gonna be impossible for them to social distance. If you work with children who are severely disabled, um, that you're gonna have, you're gonna have to have, we're gonna have to negotiate some sort of hazardous duty pay because you're putting yourself at risk. I know some jurisdictions they've negotiated a, a stipend um, for that and special um, uh, PPEs for them. And then what was the other piece to that, Josh? Josh? Uh, yes, there's a question around um, sick leave. Right yeah. now you get 10 days up to, it was up to uh, December, I believe that was. And what we're hoping for is that the federal government will extend that in the upcoming um, uh, package that, um, sent that uh, he's not a senator anymore, that President Biden is trying to, to move through the House and through the Senate. Um, I believe that Dr. Golson has every intent on um, extending that because she was giving that even before that bill was passed, the stimul initial stimulus bill was passed. Um, the issue is contact, right? So if you're contact, if you contact some, if you come in contact with somebody, how many days, and we need to negotiate this, right? If you get in contact with somebody because of contact tracing, how do we know that you, actually got it or not, you might just need to be quarantined for a couple of days to make sure you don't get sick and then go back. But for the actual sickness, I believe if you contracted it while you're um, at work, that she's still given the 10 days, but we can verify that. Um, and it is part of our request um, that that continue. So this question says that uh, even with the vaccine, you can still contract the virus and still be a carrier of it. You're less mm -hmm. likely to die for it. So does the union plan to negotiate some sort of mass testing to ensure that educators and students are safe uh, still because we'll still, still need to do testing? I'm not sure I understand that question. So, Teresa, can I 
talk through that one a little bit. Yeah, that was a part of our, our demands and talking about what the feasibility of that looks like. I know in, in Massachusetts and other places, um, they've been able to do pool testing, meaning that you do it every week, it's consistent and everyone gets tested. They look at a pool of people and then you can really be able to target and see, see if the virus is spreading or has spread in that particular place. I'm not familiar with all the details, but that is something that I think we should um, inquire about and look into about scale and what is possible in Prince George's County. So I just got a text message from someone that the the House of Delegates um, has um, already voted to override the, the veto on the blueprint. So great news. That's <laughs> That's a half a billion dollars that will come to Prince George's County Public Schools over the next 10 years. Okay. Um, is there, are there any other questions that um, we have not uh, touched on? No, I and think we've gone through a lot of them. There's a lot of questions about specific buildings, ventilation and mold concerns. And again, it's important to get involved on your school's uh, COVID cleaning committee and that checklist for this. Uh, individual building concerns has to be addressed through your administration specifically as we've gone over. And we're willing to help you do that. And so you can contact your UNICERV director or email us if you have questions about that. But individual building concerns have to be addressed. We need you guys to help us to figure out where those concerns are. And what we will do is um, what we have asked for, I believe in the letter, I saw um, an update on certain facilities. Um, I know that there are some schools where the ventilation is not good. And so we need to make sure that um, we request from the school system um, information about what buildings have actually been done because they said a lot of them had been done already while we were while we were out. So, um, but that's where that checklist comes in because you can ask your principal, when's the last time they checked the ventilation in here? And if they say, well, they haven't been here, then you know you got to follow up with that with us. Um, the, um, when the checklist comes out, there's going to be a job form as you're moving. We move through this over the next couple of weeks, right? If you're 100% sure that something is an issue, then let's work on it, right? If you're not sure, find out first. And that way we'll be able to give you the support and the help that you need. Um, Christy? Yes. Um, anything, any final thoughts you wanna add to this? Well, I just, I wanna make it clear that this, the state the CDC uh, and many of the county health departments have taken the position that you don't re need or a vaccine is not required to put students back into the building. Um, because that is, and they've completely changed the health metrics and they've all said that the vaccine's not required in order to return students to the building. Um, but that makes the CDC requirements about social distancing, mask, um, there has to be a robust contact tracing plan. All of that has to be in place. Yes, we're encouraging and we're pushing and we've taken the position that it really truly is only safe when teachers have been and staff educators have been appropriately vaccinated. But I will tell you that's not the political position of the health department, the CDC um, or the governor. Um, for that matter. And so, and many of our county health departments have also flip-flopped on that and come out and said, you don't have to have the vaccine to go back, but that makes all of these, this healthy and safe work environment, this building checklist, it makes it all that much more important. So I don't want folks thinking that, well, I don't have the vaccine, so I don't have to go back yet. That's not exactly true. You need to make sure that you have an appropriate leave status with the school system. So if you're thinking that you're gonna be able to continue to telework because you have an underlying health condition, you have to put your application in. You have to get the letter from the doctor. You can't assume that the school system is aware of any kind of underlying health condition. Um, you've got to get the letter from the doctor and you have to go through the process because if you don't show up and you don't have a status with your employer, it could result in a recommendation for your termination. Um, so I, don't, I wanna make sure everybody understands that don't make assumptions go through the process, get the paperwork, 
Um, and if you need accommodations, have the doctor sign off on that or the appropriate healthcare provider sign off on that documentation. It doesn't have to necessarily be a doctor, it has to just be an appropriate medical provider. Sign off on that documentation, um, indicating that you need, there's a medical need for those accommodations. Um, and just, just maintain a status with your employer. Um, they've taken the position that they want students back in the building. Um, and now the question is whether or not they can make those buildings healthy and safe, vaccinated or not, um, but make those buildings healthy and safe for everyone that's in there. Um, and I, I, there were a lot of questions in there. I know with special ed and the, the really young kids, um, you are considered in a lot of instances, a direct service provider. And as a direct service provider, you are entitled to additional PPE. You're treated almost like a nurse. Um, so those are additional conversations that should be occurring. Uh, PGCEA should initiate those conversations around how are we dealing with that group of personnel that really can't maintain proper social distancing. Um, these are kids that you do have to hold their hand. So what additional PPE is going to be provided to that group of educators um, so that they, you're safe um, and the environment remains safe? So those are all, there's really, really good questions. Um, and in terms of, and there's been counties in the state of Maryland, Cecil County, for example, and many counties on the Eastern shore, they've been back in school. Um, and I know it's a little bit different um, because they're smaller on a smaller scale, they have less buildings to deal with, but they have found a way to do it and to do it safely um, in many instances. And especially those uh, related service providers, music teachers, and some of those others, especially when you travel and you don't have a classroom, making sure that you're only going to one building in a day. You're not going from building to building to building. You're not going to two different buildings in the same day, um, making sure that you're somewhat contained. Um, and so you're not increasing exposure to other staff in a different building because you've been different places. Um, so there's there's been those conversations, but these are all things that as we work through this, um, these are all really good issues that you raise um, and they need to be addressed. And you know, you're early enough in this process that if you have access to your buildings, it'd be great if you can start some of those conversations, get this building checklist, start the conversations, meet up with your custodial or your maintenance staff, um, talk to your administration about going through and checking through and just getting like updates. Like when was the last time your HVAC system was uh, maintained? You know, what, when was the maintenance done? And what was the checklist that came as a result of that maintenance review? Um, I'm seeing what, the, the request for the checklist in the, in the, in the quest Q and A, everybody who signed in, we're going to send it out to every member, actually, everybody, everybody's going to get a copy of this checklist. We're not hiding from what it is that we want people to do. We want everybody to be involved with this. Um, and I did see a question about, um, uh, the, 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 the vents, more questions about ventilation, questions about facilities in your building, about class sizes, all of these things are on, in that checklist for you to look at. I will say to you that the CDC guidelines that are going to come out are going to be different. I know that for a fact. And I know there was some problems with the, um, the, the comments and, you know, Chrissy and I disagree on this, right? Because, you know, her job as the lawyer is to tell us that we can't take any kind of job action against the school system because of the collective bargaining laws that say that we can't strike or do any action that will prevent school from occurring. And I would say to her, and I'll say it again, I believe it is unconscionable for them to request for people to go back that are not vaccinated. So we will have that, um, have that, um, have that conversation. So we will, um, I want to wrap this up for this evening and thank everybody who got on the call. We had at one point 20, um, almost 2,600 members on the call. Let everyone know that they will be receiving an email with to their personal email addresses with the checklist and the letter and, and the Valentine's Day um, piece. I also, before I leave, I would be remiss if I didn't say the elections are going on until the end of next week for MSCA and PGCEA. And it is important that you look at the candidates carefully 
and that you vote. Now on the state level and on the local level, um, we run both elections concurrently. So having said that, I wanna thank all of you for being on here tonight. I wanna thank Christy Anderson, Christy Lynch, Damon for being here. And for those of you who don't know Damon, Damon is the Prince George's County assigned attorney. So um, he, um, he works very closely with us with um, all of our cases that we have to work on. If your question was not answered tonight, please send it to contacts at pgcea.org contacts at pgcea.org and please review our newsletter that comes out every Sunday. We try to get it out by one o'clock. Sometimes I'm a little pokey because things change all the time with this COVID stuff. So everyone have a safe evening. God bless you. And um, please um, look at your email for this. It will be going out very shortly. Thank you. Thank you.